Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wizards Table. Right here on RU Media, I am your host, Ken Allen. I'm your host, Mr. B. So how you been doing, B? Pretty good. And yourself? I'm doing great. You know, I just finished, <clears throat> excuse me, I just finished doing an uh, interview uh, on another podcast, like literally just finished, like, eight to 10 minutes ago uh, on uh, a podcast called uh, Bigfoot and the Bunny. Oh, nice. How did that go? Oh, it was great. I love those guys. I, I, You know what? I enjoyed it so much. I've been on their show once before, but this time we got to cover so much. We got to talk about so much. Uh, we talked about angels and demons and gin and all that good stuff. So maybe next time we can talk about the Nephilim. So, <laughs> awesome. So uh, tonight we have a really cool guy. His name is Alaric Albertson. Uh, he is an author of many great books on Saxon paganism, Saxon sorcery. Uh, you are, Alaric, a uh, you consider yourself a Saxon druid, am I correct? Yes. And um, so you embraced uh, paganism at what a very early age how old were you uh, exactly would you say when you actually embraced or had the calling so to speak to uh, uh get involved in your uh, ancestral spiritual and religious path i was 17 and um you know it just seemed like it was a really early age because 17 was a long time ago for me wow. right yeah and that you know, you hear people say, oh, I've been a witch or pagan or whatever all my life. And I guess in some ways I was, but as far as consciously, you know, I'm not going to say, I, oh, I knew I was a witch when I was, you know, a, a little boy. You know, when I was a little boy, I was in the G.I. Joe, you know. <laughs> um, you know, when I was, uh, I, I was always spiritual, though, and on, on some level. And I grew up in a Presbyterian family, and I was totally into that until sometime after my 15th birthday. And at that point, I was very much involved with my church. I did the supper club social thing, and, and I, I, I was the one young person who met with the adults to plan the Sunday school lessons, things like that. And then one day at Sunday school, another guy who was a year older than me and just hadn't grown up quite as privileged, made a, a disparaging comment about the Bible. And I wanted to refute it. And then I realized I had never actually read the book. <laughs> you know, I had it spoon fed to me you know, the parts they wanted me to hear, but I never actually sat down and read it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so I made the mistake of doing that. And I was kind of appalled. Uh, God really needs a better, you know, publicity agent. <laughs> there are things in there that are just horrific. Yes. Um, and now, as an adult, I could go back, because I recognize now a lot of that is myth, and I could go back and explain things um, to a younger me. I'd probably make a pretty good preacher if I wanted to do that, except I don't follow that religion now. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, then... Okay, can I tell him? Uh, that's my dog. He's not getting all of the attention, so that's okay. Um. Anyway, I I uh, could have talked to myself about everything, but I didn't have me to talk to. And this was 1969. Okay, so it was kind of a different world. And yeah, uh, not to interrupt, but 1969 was uh, a groundbreaking era. Am I right in that? Or am I right when I say that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of things are changing. See, this is why you cannot bark. I'm on television. <laughs> this is Caesar. This is my little familiar, and he's the one who has to make noise. But anyway, so yeah, it's like, 
I couldn't talk to anybody because it was 1969. And I, you know, I'm a gay man. And then it was not talked about. Right. At right. All. It wasn't even talked about disparagingly. To find mm -hmm. out gay would be like, you know, finding out you're an alien or something, you know? Sure. Just something that was not real. Uh, I actually had to go to the local library and go back in the stacks and found, uh, oh, God. what's that man's name? He was really famous for doing his sex research. Well, anyway, he managed to write the most boring book ever on human male sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> but in that book, as dry and dull as it was, I found out that I was not totally unique. You know, so this was kind of where my headspace was. I couldn't talk to people about that. Nobody talked about it. So nobody said, you know, it, I mean, it, it wasn't like my parents had said, don't eat your friends, you know, just like it was cannibalism. They, you know, it's like, you just know this is something you're probably not supposed to do. So I, there was that one little snag. I hit that one part in Leviticus. Oh, yes. The, you know what I call Leviticus? The clobber book. <laughs> well, it was, yeah, it's like I'm reading this and here I've been told my whole life about how God is love and God loves you and God accepts you and blah, blah, blah. And here I'm looking at this thing where it says, if a man lays with a man as with a woman, they both shall be stung to death. Yeah. Until their blood is upon them. That is engraved in my mind. Yeah. You know? And I was horrified. <clears throat> you know? Sure. So, God wanted me stoned to death until my blood was upon me. Because you happen to be born a gay man. And it's not a, it's not a choice. It's not a decision. You are born that way. Point blank, period. Absolutely. You know, here's something that you know, God created me. He created me in a certain way. It's, I mean, I'm given like what I was told, you know, and then I'm reading this where I'm supposed to be murdered for that. Yeah. You know, um, and who am I going to talk to about this? I can't talk to my minister. I can't talk to my grandparents. I can't mm -hmm. talk to my parents. It's like there was nobody to talk to. So I gave it a little bit of thought, and I suddenly was no longer Christian. It's, I'm, I was done. You know, um, It wasn't like a big agonizing thing where it took me years to come to grips with this. It took me probably about 27 minutes to realize I wanted to have nothing to do with that God anymore understandable um, so then I for well, more than months for almost two years it's like I looked for something to fill that void and I read everything I read Eastern you know about Eastern religions I read the Book of Mormon which is like the you know like the Bible in acid you know I, <laughs> yeah like I just read everything I could get my hands on and I, it took forever and then finally I found um a book on witchcraft, which I fact came across it by accident. And uh, I probably would not have pursued it because, you know, it was a book on witchcraft. Right, right. Yeah. And again, now we're at 1971. So it's like, I'm, if I'm gonna do this, I might as well just tattoo an L right here, you know? <laughs> so I, however, I actually, it with me. I took it to school with me to read during study hall, and I thought I was really safe because I put other books on top of it. But as it happened, in a class of mine, there was a girl, well, senior high school woman, who was already practicing, who was sitting right next to me in the class. And of course, when she looked at me, she didn't see the top that I carefully covered. She saw the spine. Yeah, so she asked me about it later, and then she introduced me to some more people. And it still took a while because witchcraft, you know, and if you're and now to me, that's my normal. Mm -hmm. but if it's not, it, it's something you're hesitant about, or I was. Um, so it took a number of months before I kind of reconciled myself to. That was where I wanted to go. And that's the only word they had for it. I mean, that's what everyone's, it was like witchcraft was what you had. Right. <clears throat> Lewis, uh, 
Church of All Worlds, Oberon was dealing with the word pagan. But outside Church of All Worlds... Oh, Oberon Zell Ravenheart, right? Yeah, uh -huh. he's the one who popularized the word pagan. Mm -hmm. Pagan was not being used by most people then. You know, um, we didn't have the language to express it. So that's kind of how I got where I was. Basically, how, what happened? Well, I made the mistake of reading the Bible. <laughs> I definitely identify with that. That's how I got into a little bit of Minecraft too. Is I started out Christian and there was so much that I didn't agree with at such a young age that just like you, I started reading into everything else that I could get my hands on. And that's one of the things that has really drawn me to magic is that it's so organic and it's so just good and pure, even on the dark side, it's it's not, you know, doing things for the sake of doing things or doing things because some hard and fast rule of somebody is evil. It, it's easy to understand and it's customizable and it, you can align it to your core beliefs without having to go against the entire system. And I think it's beautiful. I totally agree with you on that. That's one thing I like about it. You could be very different. I was talking to a, a friend of mine years and years ago uh, in Kansas City when I was living there a woman I knew, and I mentioned somebody else who we knew, <clears throat> and I said something about this other person was just really weird, and she said, how can you say that? It's like, everyone we know is really weird. I wasn't <laughs> in a bad way necessarily. I was just observing that from my perspective, this person was really weird. Mm -hmm. I now live in a world where it's okay mm -hmm. to be really weird. Yeah. And, and that's something I have learned, uh, you know, as a magical person is that weird is relative. You know, some of the weirdest people I know are my blood kin who still do the Christian thing. Mm -hmm. They are weird as can be from my perspective. That doesn't make them worse. It just makes them different. And, uh, you know, I think that's one of the beautiful things about magic. And in my community, uh, one of my books, okay, can I plug my stuff? I guess. Absolutely, Absolutely. of course, please, yeah. because I have some of your books and I love your work. To Walk a Pagan Path, the whole reason I wrote this, the incentive to write this, um, you know who Christopher Penzak is, I'm sure. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Well, he was, he and I are friends and we were in a discussion once because we are almost at Magically speaking, philosophically speaking, we are like at polar opposites. He does things completely different than I do. But we get along really, really well, and we have a great deal of respect for each other. And he had mentioned in a conversation, we were just talking about this, and he said he thought it was because we both walked the walk. <clears throat> that for us, magic was not something we did it the full moon or we did when we felt like it. It was something that was part of our existence. And that's why we get on really well is because we saw that in each other. It's not a practice. It's a lifestyle. Yes. And that's why I wrote this because it, I thought to myself from other conversations I had with other people, I felt like there were a lot of people out there who don't incorporate it into their lifestyle because there weren't a lot of books about that. There wasn't a lot talking about what do you do after you've washed out the chalice mm -hmm. and everybody went home. You know, it's like they'll tell you what rituals to do and, and how to do this and how to do this, but they don't really talk about incorporating it into your life. So mm -hmm. I wrote a book that was specifically about how to live as a pagan rather than how to worship these gods or do these spells or whatever. Beautiful. And apparently it was needed because it sold really well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it still is. You know, one of my favorite books by you is um, uh, uh, The Weird Working Book. I love that book. This one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful work. <laughs> and um, I, I want you to keep talking, okay? But I just want to throw this in here real quick. Uh, side note, I love your hat. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> now I work with the Elder Futhark runes. Um, that's the runes I work with. That's the runes I grew up with. 
Um, I've been working with Rune since I was 16. I'm 45 now. Um, I'm, I do not consider myself a Rune master, but I do know a good amount about the Elder Futhark. Now, you work with the Anglo-Saxon runes, which are 33? It depends. There's okay. Nine, the Old English rune poem describes 29. Okay. And there are five more. Four more. <laughs> okay. Wise man here who cannot count to four. Four more that we don't really know anything about. Um, and sometimes when you add those other four, people will call it the Northumbrian runes because that's where those other four were mostly found. And those are mostly just an out, or probably mostly just an alphabetical thing, a way to make other sounds that they needed. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say they weren't used for magic or divination or anything because you, somebody, some plot place probably did. Sure. But there's nothing, it's not like the old English rune poem where we have a description of a of what they were supposed to mean. Um, for example, stan, which means stone. Um, yes. It's, it's a very common word. It's a, in the English language, the word stone is found everywhere. There's like you know, bunches of iterations of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, flagstone, you know, that, there's a certain where I can't remember the word, but it's basically meant the place where you get the stone, you know. Oh, like a quarry? <laughs> yeah, but there was yeah. a stone, but that, that was uh, in a lot of words as, uh, as part of the language. But we don't really know what, if any, mystery that had. So some people will include that. You know, people who, are, who want to work with anglo saxon runes will include those runes, um, but they don't, you, they just have to extrapolate their own meaning. And you can, it means stone. So what does stone mean to you? I mean, like hard, yeah. solid, you know, immovable. There's a lot of- we got, Foundation. You know, stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know? Right. I mean, stone. Demon. Yeah. Um, ooh, actually, hey. Assistant. <laughs> yeah. I think it's in that bag. <laughs> in the bag that's my desk on the ground. We got a very unhappy Caesar. <laughs> so, so your your familiar is in full effect to this evening, huh? <laughs> That's what that's one of the things, uh, Mistress B, that makes this show so great is little things like that. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, just it's so real. real. Uh huh. Hey. Absolutely, it's not like some sort of scripted interview. We're literally just gathering all up at the table, sharing some ideas, sharing what we know and what we think, and that's the beauty of it. Just friends having a good time. Wearing yeah. cool hats. He gets jealous of things, you know. See, he's not getting attention from me right now, so. Well, you know, I, Alaric, I had a wolf. Actually, I had two wolves. Legitimately real wolves, okay? I raised them from birth. One was named Sage, and one was named Vanna. And they were like my spirit guardians. And I loved these wolves. They were like my children. And... I was part of their pack, part of their pack, you know, so I, I know what it's like. I know what it's like. Kind of a, that's, dogs are kind of a spirit animal for me. And, okay. And now there's something where I could say ever since I was a little boy, because uh, I mean, I grew up with them. I can remember my first sister was a Cocker Spaniel named Cookie, you know, and you know, I mean, I've always had dogs in my life. I've always, I've always been a part of my life. Um, you know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, and I do feel like I'm a part of the pack. The person I'm talking to periodically who you don't see, um, he and his wife are my best friends here. And he could tell you, uh, you know, it's like dogs. I mean, I probably knew the names of their dogs before I knew their names. <laughs> <laughs> and I still, I go to their house and their dog is just delighted to see me, you know, and I always make sure I to say something to him because he's like a buddy. Um, one of their dogs passed away this year and it just oh. tore me up because I was very, very fond of him. 
And yeah, I mean, I get as close to dogs as I get to human beings. Well, you know, I okay, I like I like people sometimes, okay. <laughs> but when it, when it comes to the four legged, the winged, the finned, that's my people. Yeah. Wow, wow, what a cup, dude. Show that again. come on, come on. Yeah. What what you got in there? You got mead in there or water? Yeah, just a little tea to keep my you know, the whole pandemic thing and I love and I love that cup, man. My That's doctor awesome. wanted me to take some pills for my anxiety and I tried, but I mean I, I ought to sell them on the black market because you get really stoned. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's like, I mean, you see these walls, they're not all that fascinating. I walked into this room. Oh, my God. On these buildings, and I just stopped. I probably stood there for like 20 or 30 minutes admiring the color of my walls. That's what these pills were like. <clears throat> so oh. after a while, and he knows this, I said, I'm just not going to do this. I'm an herbalist. I'm going to make my own thing. And right, right, right. So, uh, uh, as and you are an herbalist. You are a very uh, 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 knowledgeable herbalist. So like, for example, uh, valerian and stuff like that. You use valerian? Not as, as you might think. Um, not because uh -huh. there's anything wrong. It's very potent. It's just disgusting. Yeah, it's, yeah. It smells it's horrible. It smells, I mean, I smell valerian. And I, it reminds me of when I had to take gym in junior high school. You go into the locker room and it's like, oh my God, what does that smell? There you go. <laughs> now I know what the smell was. You know, it just, it reeks. And, um, yeah. you know, so if if I needed it, I wouldn't avoid it or anything like that. But it's not right really to work with. You know, and here, here, here's what I found. And I may be wrong. And you as, and I consider you a master herbalist. And, and, and I consider you a master herbalist because of, the books that you have published that I have read, you know, your stuff. I have taken valerian and sometimes it does nothing. So I'm like, okay, increase the dose a little bit. <laughs> well, then it has the adverse effect. Mm -hmm. It has me wired. So is that legit? It can, it can, it can be unpredictable. Okay. It's another reason why. And, and, you know, it depends on who you are. It can wind up giving you headaches. There's, there's side effects to it. It's just not my favorite herb. If I if I had somebody who's really having bad insomnia, I might suggest that as a possibility, but it wouldn't be my go-to herb as a rule. And honestly, it's like if it does work the way it's supposed to work, it makes you too sleepy, if you know right. what I mean. I mean, oh, I, yeah. or if you were to wake up in the middle of the night and had to pee, which I often do, you know, I... I I mean, you might hurt yourself just because you're so groggy and stumbling around. You know, so just not my favorite. Yeah, but. it's definitely that feeling of like almost waking up hungover. Yeah. Where you can't wake up, you can't focus, and it's just, it, you feel groggy for the rest of the day. So it's almost not worth it in mm -hmm. some instances. Well, what about like blue skull cap? No, that's better. That's a good one. Okay. What would and, be your go-to herb that you would suggest? Well, skull cap would be skull cap, maybe hops. I mean, this it's not something I've had to deal with a lot. I know there are people who are insomniacs. That has never been an issue for me. Um, I have no trouble going to sleep. Sometimes I have a really hard time waking up, but going to sleep. <laughs> Alaric. You know what helps me fall asleep? Is it something you can say? No. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I, know. Oh, I don't know where your mind's going. But... <laughs> Honestly, you know what helps me fall asleep? What? Watching uh, Star Trek. Captain Picard or Catherine Janeway. That helps me fall asleep. <laughs> that can be just as good as any kind of herb, too. My husband will read when he has any yeah. kind of trouble going to sleep, he'll just pick up a book and start reading for a while. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting, you know, getting your mind distracted a little bit. That will definitely help me fall asleep. I just need a good book light. So hopefully my husband 
Hint, <laughs> hint. Well, buy me a book like that. Are you listening? <laughs> yeah, I think he's listening. <laughs> You're writing this down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, um, your book, The Path of a, a Saxon Sorcerer, again, not trying to get off subject, but wanting to get on this subject. Great book. One of my favorites. I love it. Now, <clears throat> with... Um, no, go ahead. Keep going with that. Yeah. With, <laughs> Honestly, I mean, that is my, it used to be called Weird Working. Now it's a handbook of Saxon sorcery and magic. And you know, I I have not written a book that I'm, I'm not proud of. Good. I shouldn't say that. I have never submitted for publication a book that I'm not proud of. I have yeah. written some crap, you know, <laughs> but I'm not going to send that in, you know. Uh, on the other hand, there's certain things that you, you like more or less than the others. And this one, the one you're talking about, in my opinion, at this point in my life, it's my great work. It's the one that I'm very, very proud of. Um, well, I have the original copy, the first one you came out with, and the texture. Perfect. The outward texture is amazing. I don't know what that's made of, what kind of paper that is. Yeah. But just to feel that you know and, and to me when it comes to books <clears throat> i prefer books over tablets i like the feel of the book the texture of the book the smell of the book i love that yeah yeah plus the That's ability to put little notes and sticky notes and flowers and whatever else that you find while you're reading that book in there having the book is magic in and of itself to me yes so um yeah but that's not the only book you've written. You've written other books. Will you tell us about your other books? Please. Well, okay. I'll go through. <laughs> you name titles. I'll pull up the covers. I got you covered. Right, the, beginning. the first one was the first one that got the first one that got published was um, uh, Travels Through Middle Earth. That's it right. Is, yeah, it is not in print anymore, um, and maybe that's okay. I'm very proud of it, like I am with all of my books. And uh, that was kind of interesting. I mentioned Christopher Penzak earlier. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. He's the one who convinced me to write that. Oh, did he? Yeah. Yeah. I had, I tried, I mean, I always kind of played around with writing and I had tried. And I actually, this is a little thing that most people don't know, I had actually sent a full manuscript on the practice of magic to Llewellyn Publications in 1984. Oh. And it was rejected. Ah. Okay. Should I tell them that part of the story too? Yeah, yeah come on with it. Come on with it. Well, yeah, okay. First, the good part was it was rejected. On the other hand, I got a letter, a full letter back from Carl Weshe, who was pretty much like the big high honcho at Llewellyn at the time. And um, it was the nicest rejection letter I had ever received. Oh. To date, it still is. Okay. It was very encouraging. He told me he loved the style of my writing. He really liked what I did. He said they weren't going to take it. But the only reason they weren't going to take it was because they were printing a very similar book by Ray Buckland. And so... Oh they didn't want the two books to compete with each other. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I wasn't totally discouraged. It took a long time before I got it. That was because of Christopher that I gave it another shot. But I, I wasn't completely discouraged because I'd gotten this nice rejection. So for years, I thought the only reason they didn't publish it was because they were publishing Ray's book. And I kind of resented that a little bit. I didn't resent Ray. I've always right. along very well with Ray Buckland. Uh, so you did you I, did I you know him? Read the big blue book. Yeah, it, big blue. It was the one that booted me out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, just, just this year, wasn't it? Yeah, just this year. This person who you can't see sitting over here. He and his wife have a copy. You know, you, you can show the person sitting next to you. I'm okay with that. <laughs> they don't mind if they see me. <laughs> they, they loaned me a copy. <laughs> and, and I 
actually read it for the first time since it was published decades ago. And Carl Weshey was big a liar. <laughs> was, I mean, maybe that was par a partial truth, but the big blue book blew mine out of the water. Mine was <laughs> really as good as that one. I'm really glad that I lived with that thought that the only reason they weren't publishing it was because they were publishing Rays and it would have competed, you know. It made me feel better about myself, but when I read it, I realized he was really being, he was a really nice, kind man who saw yes. the writer yeah. might have potential <clears throat> and he didn't want to discourage him. So he kind of told a little white magic lie there. Um, but I don't resent that or regret it or anything because 25 years later, uh, Christopher and I were at a festival between the worlds. And we had attended that, the same festival, like a, maybe a year before that also. And when I say we, I mean, just like we both happened to be there. It wasn't like we went together mm -hmm. or anything like that. He lives up in uh, New something in the Northeast. One of those little states. <laughs> <laughs> the little states that are this big. Yep. And, um, Anyway, he, at the end of this one festival, he'd come to a workshop I presented and he came up to me and he said, you really need to write a book. And I was like, oh, nobody's gonna read my book. And we kind of had this little back and forth thing and I still wasn't convinced, but driving home from that festival, suddenly I realized I wanted to write that book. And I knew who I wanted to write it for I wanted to write it for this guy in 1971 who'd been very disillusioned with Christianity and had been looking for something. So I wrote what I considered a book for a person new to paganism that cut through a lot of the crap that's out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's the path of a Saxon pagan uh, because that's who I was, and who I am. And because of the timing that this came out from 2009, I titled it Travels Through Middle Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, just really unashamedly, I'm um, cashing in a little bit on the uh, popular <laughs> Lord of the Rings movies at the time. Uh, but it wasn't a lie or anything like that. Middle Earth, I mean, Tolkien, he was a great man, great scholar, but you know, it's, it's not like he made all of this stuff up. You know, you, even his languages, a lot of his languages, they weren't just made up. The mm -hmm. language Rohirrim, that, that's Old English. That's what they are speaking. Right, you know, right. King Theoden, Theoden means king. So he's yeah, king. absolutely. Yeah, you know. Um, and anyway, Middle Earth, he calls this place Middle Earth because that's what our ancestors called it. In Anglo-Saxon culture, it was it was Midgard. Midgard, Middle Earth, Middle Garth. Midgard, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it meant the middle yard, the middle earth. Mm -hmm. um, so travels through middle earth. It was basically, here's who I am. Here's what I do. Here's how you approach paganism. I feel like it was a book that if you wanted to follow Saxon paganism, it was great. But even if it turned out that you were called to the Greek gods or the Roman gods or whatever, that book would still take you in the right direction. Yeah. So for those of us that are unfamiliar, can you explain Saxon paganism a little bit more? Because I'm not personally familiar. I'm a relative beginner. And so I haven't delved into all of the different terminology and this everything. Early English paganism, pre-Christian England. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a kissing cousin of Norse. Yep. Sometimes. Okay. People who are ignorant of it will sometimes describe it as Norse with different names and words, and that's not at all true. Uh, there's a, a lot of differences. In fact, honestly, it's like if for some reason I could not be Anglo-Saxon, I wouldn't be Norse. I'd go in some other direction. I mean, I'm not really attracted to uh, the Norse path at all, which is not saying there's anything wrong about it. You know, just not for me. Uh, but there's a lot of differences. Uh, one, there's kind of a cultural difference where the Norse, it's much more of an individual hero 
sort of thing, whereas Anglo-Saxons, the early English, your people were a lot, a lot more important, your tribe. Mm -hmm. And that's terribly important. Guy who just popped his head in, he knows this. He knows that if anything happened to him or his wife or his children, I would be right there because they are my family now. You know, they are my tribe. And, you know, I basically have tribe kind of all over the world now because I've lived in different places. And all of those people still mean so much to me. Uh, I don't do things on my own. As an Anglo-Saxon, the way I perceive things is when I do something, I'm there's a whole community behind me that's part of that. So there's kind of a cultural difference there. And there's even differences in the pantheons. We're kind of fortunate in that, you know, there's uh, in the Scandinavian oriented communities, there's sometimes disagreements about Loki. And some people want to worship Loki, and other people will not let you in their ritual if you're going to worship Loki. And that's right. That's right. You know. And I, I have worked with Loki extensively for many years, and I love Loki. It's, it's not an issue for me because uh, I don't know if it's because the uh, English never let him on the shores or he just wasn't interested, but there is no Loki in Anglo-Saxon tradition. He's mm -hmm. just not there. Right. Hmm. And, you know, the Scandinavians don't have Elstra, goddess of the east in the spring and the dawn, you know, so they have slightly different pantheons. Mm-hmm. And even when you have a god where you say, well, this is the Anglo-Saxon this, or this is the Norse this, uh, Brian Branston in his book that came out in the 50s, The Lost Gods of England, which was kind of one of the first definitive books on, could you go put him in the bedroom? Just go ahead and put him in the bedroom and he'll be fine. I'm so sorry. He's usually very well behaved, but- No worries. But anyway, uh, you know, he, Branston said, you know, Woden, the Anglo-Saxon Woden is nothing at all like the Norse Odin. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to know, actually, if you want to know Woden, because again, Tolkien was a great scholar. If you want to know Woden, watch the Lord of the Rings movies or read the books and look at Gandalf. Absolutely. You know, I mean, Gandalf is... He was patterned on Woden, and he's totally there. He's he's not a soft, fluffy deity whatsoever. And and as Frodo Baggins can tell you, if Gandalf says, "I need you to do this," you know, it's kind of oh, right. Yeah, but not because he's really harsh, but because he's looking out for the multiverse. And mm -hmm. if he wants you to help with something, it's kind of a going to be a rough ride. But it's something that has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, but he's not a warrior guy. He's not, and I I don't necessarily mean that he's not the same deity, but he's definitely a different aspect. In the same way that you know, your mother is somebody's lover, but you usually don't look at her that way, unless <laughs> ideally, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, you're not looking at her that way, you know. Uh, and it's you know, in that sense, they're almost like two different people because, you know. Odin is this warrior god who's preparing for Ragnarok, whereas Woden is this wise old wizard who's who travels through the worlds and is keeping an eye on everything. So the way I perceive it, I also think of another thing. It's not just a matter of these people lived here and these people lived here. The paganisms that came to us from these people, the Anglo-Saxon stuff came pre 600 AD. Yeah. Okay. Most of the Norse stuff, even though it was recorded by Christians, was recorded in like 1000 or later. So you have centuries of difference. Mm -hmm. okay. By the time you have all of this Norse lore being recorded, these people in the far north were the last people in Europe. All of Europe had fallen to this new weird idea that there was only one God and you had to worship that one That's God. That's right. A spiritual genocide swept across Europe, destroying entire cultures. Absolutely, 100%. And you see some of that, you see some of that in the uh, Beowulf sagas. 
Yes. And so by the time you get to the north, all you've got, you've got these few people who live way up in the north. People, oh, oh, the Viking raiders. You know why they were raiding? Because nobody would trade with them. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a growing season of, of about three and a half weeks, mm, yeah. you know, and, and all of a sudden you're the bad guys, you know. But yeah, it's like they were fighting for their survival. You had a whole different culture going on because you had it was later in a whole different dynamic. They were the last pagans. Yes. You know, so I think a lot of it has to do with the time frame that the lore has been passed down from, as much as it has to do with location of where this stuff took place. But nevertheless, because of that, Anglo-Saxon paganism has a much gentler approach. You don't have the chess being warrior type stuff. It doesn't mean we can't be warriors because trust me, we can kick butt if we have to. <laughs> you know, but a lot of our lore comes from things that had to do with agriculture and farming. You know, it's like you'll hear about the Anglo-Saxon invasion. It's like most of those invader, invaders were farmers. They took a sword if they had to, but they were out there living like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look at things, I look at uh, when, when I am researching my own stuff, I look at early English tradition. Uh, sometimes you don't necessarily know whether it was indigenous or not. So you have to use your best judgment on, on that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, we're, we're much more the maypole and farming and harvest type people than, than you know, the plunderers, Viking sort. You know? Right, right. And even even Viking, uh, it wasn't a race; it was an undertaking, and it was simply an A. Yeah. Like, hey, we're the pirates! Yay! Right? Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that though. That nicer side of of what a lot of people don't see. Do you think that that sort of um, highlight on agriculture and growing in togetherness is what kind of drew you into herbalism? Um, I would say that who I am is what drew me to both of those. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, um, again, I don't want to give the impression that I was this big old witch when I was four and a half years old. Um, however, I had a lot of earth spirituality instilled in me from a very young age. My grandfather was so in tune with the world. And uh, I call him Papa. And uh, Papa on weekends, when, he, when I'd be staying with my grandparents, they lived down near Little Rock down in Arkansas. And when I was staying with them, uh, Papa would take me out on weekends to this Oxbow Lake. And we'd go fishing. And while we were out there sitting, and I mean, I was little. Anymore, he'd probably be arrested for doing that with a child. I mean, you know, I could barely walk, and I was out there on this in this boat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, we it was it was a commune, you know, we were caught communing with nature, and he would talk about Mother Earth and different creatures and point out different plants and, and animals while we were out there, and really got me into it. And then when we come home. He was an avid gardener and I mean, to the point where like his, his yard was actually put on television once because it was like this wonderland of flora, just amazing what he could do with plants. And he would teach me things like that. I mean, I was, when I was like in grade school, I had no trouble with sex education because I knew all about it. I knew it was a lot better if you were doing it with a plant. <laughs> still in, in grade school he showed me how to take how to transfer uh, pollen from the stamen to the pistol and how to you know like breed different varieties of plants and uh, you, you know what amaryllis are those bulbs that they sell in abundance at Christmas time yes those from yeah. seed and he would breed his own like, like make his own crosses and some of them were really beautiful some of them turned out really weird <laughs> from seed. He's the only person I ever knew who actually did that so I just went out and bought the bulb. Uh, so I, I was exposed to that a lot and I feel like 
like uh, that really took, well, I know it took. He really liked the fact that I was showing an interest. I was probably the only boy in my high school that had a subscription to a gardening magazine. <laughs> Papa subscribed me to a gardening magazine. It came every month. And, uh, you know, I, that shaped me a lot individually. And I feel like I've always had a very close uh, connection with the earth because of that. And then, you know, you don't mind me getting kind of woo-woo on this. Um, I also feel like the god Ng has mm -hmm. guided me through much of my life. Uh, and I can't really remember time. When, I mean, obviously, before I was pagan, I wasn't consciously aware of him. But I can't really think of a time when he didn't seem to be part of my life. Mm -hmm. And Ng is the, an Anglo-Saxon deity. Uh, he is, has a lot of epithets like uh, the god of this world, um, the lord of the elves. Uh, as far as archetypes, he would be the, like the Anglo-Saxon green man. So that reminds me of Frey. It's the same deity, basically. Yeah. Okay. Except I'm sure there are things that some differences there, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it reminds me of Frey or Freyr. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would be the same, same God. Which would be the brother of Freya. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Now he shows up. He's also one of the well, one of he's the only deity who shows up by name in the Old English Rune poem. So. You know, I, I know that he's a big part of my life and has been guiding me a lot. And and so that kind of a, attracts me to the herbal aspects also. Now, with regards to the Anglo-Saxon uh, paganism, uh, would uh, Ing or Frey uh, be uh, part of the tribe of the Venir? Yes. Okay. So that... that, that as important to Anglo-Saxons as it is to North so Okay. I mean, it's something you're kind of like, you're kind of conscious of that, but it just, I mean, a lot of that myth, that, that's something you see a lot of in the lore that comes down from the Viking era. But right. The references to that in Anglo-Saxon lore. But you do still have the the distinctions of Asir, Vanir, and Jotun slash Ethan? Not so much. I mean, Tell me about that then. Well, you just don't hear. I mean, it's not something that shows up in, in old English literature or anything. Okay. So how much did that? I'm not saying that they didn't have thoughts like that, but there are thoughts. You know, things do change. And again, you're talking about something. That, it was centuries later that you get the Viking lore. Always, yeah. It's hard to get away from that, isn't it? Yeah, so how, when did that evolve? It's kind of a guess on when some of this evolved. There are certain things, and, and, and we don't necessarily always know. You know, I, it helps really, I feel like, if you're going, because all of paganism, as far as historical paganism, is way back in the past, you will have people who want to be gatekeepers and tell you the right way and what the right answer is, like that. And yes. that's crap, because we just don't know, you know? Right, um, right. There is some debate on whether there is a, okay, linguistically, Freya, we would call, in, in English, we would call Freo, um, because the ah sound in early English language is a masculine suffix. Mm. Okay, and, and you know, it's like Freya just means the lady. It's not really a name, it's a name. Right. Right, it's it's and, a title, right? Yeah. So, and and lady in Old English is Freyo, just like Ing is often called Ing Freya, which just means Lord Ing. Mm -hmm. Um. And I say um too many times. I say um way too often. It's and okay. I, <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Let me be self-conscious here. There's debate on whether this Freyo ever existed for the English. Or was she a later evolution? Uh, 
I don't know. I can't tell you. Well, you know, it's interesting because you know you you know Freya, Freya Oswin. Mm -hmm. She has a theory in her book, uh, Northern Mysteries and Magic, that England, and I don't know, but it's a theory that England was actually named after Freya. Ingfre, Ingvi Fre, England. What what is your thoughts on that, if any? Okay, with all due respect to her, I think she's wrong. Okay, I, she was right. Right. Um, because I mean, it's Angle land. It's the land of the Angles. Saxon was actually what other people called the English. Like the Welsh were called the Saxons. Um, and, you know, there wasn't just one name. There were a bunch of different tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes. I mean, like a bunch of different tribes came to, you know, immigrated to uh, the British Islands. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they called themselves collectively Angles, if they called themselves collectively anything at all. A lot of times they were like duking it out, trying to figure out who gets to have which piece of land because they're all immigrants and did not have any particular borders you know, at that time until they finally wound up with seven kingdoms. But that's a whole other story. But, you know, I, I mean, it's pretty clear throughout history that England means the land of the Angles. And I said, I love the idea that it means the land of Ing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love to be have that proven to me but i personally just can't buy it and you know it's so this is another thing about paganism it's like i i feel like we tend to do this i try not to do it myself it's very easy to look back and make the past be what you want it to be sure sure you know? and i don't want that to happen either uh you know i i I'm very much aware, well, first of all, I'm very much aware of the failures of the Anglo-Saxons, of things that I find are kind of appalling that they would do. And I think those are things that need to not be swept under the carpet, but acknowledged. I mean, it's like it was part of their paganism. It isn't necessarily part of my paganism. Well, what is, what is your take on the name Albion? It was a really cool sword in the Robin Hood TV series in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> um, what things, for example, we're talking about are things that normally get swept under the rug that you obviously don't agree with? Well, how about human sacrifice? There's one thing I'm probably, I'm a little bit down on that. Just a tad, just a There's little a bit. few people where I could go along with it on. <laughs> Yeah. Selective human sacrifice. I agree. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like there are cultural changes. And, you know, to be fair, it's like a lot of human sacrifice. We do, we do that still today. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, we send people off to war, you know, when it's not real. We're not defending our country. We're trying to get more oil or something like that. Absolutely. So young people. We sacrificed a buttload of young people in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then anytime you have capital punishment, that's kind of, you know, it's like, I mean, we may not call it that, but a lot of the human sacrifice that went on in early pre-Christian England was literally capital punishment. Mm -hmm. But rather than just, you know, putting them, you know, killing them and sweeping them aside, you actually offered them to the gods. You know, they right. had something where this is their punishment there being given over to the gods. Hey, you, yeah. think, you didn't just kill them. You offered them to a yeah. specific deity and they were executed. Yeah. And then there's like kind of borderland things, that, borderland, borderline things. It depends on who you are and your lifestyle. And things. But I don't, um, I mean, there's a question of animal sacrifice. Um, I'm not entirely unopposed to animal sacrifice, depending on how it's done, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not vegan. Right. And I would not myself try to do a ritual animal sacrifice, because for me, 
it's not because I'm this wonderful little person or anything. I'm, well, I am. I'm great. I'm awesome. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> but you know, I have killed things. I've killed a lot of things. But when I kill an animal, just the killing it to eat is a sacred act. Yes. There's something going on there. You're facing the whole issue of mortality. I don't feel like I could ever focus on doing something very ritualistic while doing that. Yeah, because it's a huge exchange of energy. And yeah. yeah, it takes a lot out of you. I have yet to kill something, but I've thought about it extensively. My boyfriend and his family hunt and just in the area where we are now hunting is a big thing because we're in the south. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely had that that kind of face off with myself on if you know if it came down to it if it was to eat you i think i could do it so i definitely understand your reticence with doing it as, as part of a sacrifice because it's two separate things to focus on that are both so extremely powerful 100 percent of my attention is right there if i'm killing something i don't want any of my attention over on anything else that's what i am focused on but on the other hand, if it's done respectfully and done correctly, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, a thing that a lot of modern people don't understand about these about animal sacrifice um, was that it it wasn't a Hollywood horror show where you just killed an animal to get your rocks off. That's right. That's uh, right. Dripping down the walls, the whole nine. That's these, right. Yeah, these were people who knew where their food came from. You know, they didn't fool themselves and think when they went to, you know, the supermarket and picked up something wrapped in plastic that it just came that way. You know, so they would, an animal sacrifice, they ate most of that animal. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and, and same thing like in Greece and Rome when they had animal sacrifice, they would leave like the tail and the hide or something like that. That's what was actually was given to the gods. Because they understood that the gods didn't really need a lot of protein, you know, and you know they were giving that. They're they're basically making the act of of killing the animal a sacred act. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, I understand that if someone's vegan, they might find that really horrific or something. More power to you. But as far as I'm concerned, to recognize the impact, the import of taking another life to make that a sacred act rather than something you just take advantage of, uh, you know, uh, you take for granted, you know, and, and, you know, let's go down to Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, that's the thing. Don't tell me that it's immoral to, you know, to kill this animal in a sacred act and then go out to, to KFC. Right. That's right. For these animals, I mean, uh, like a lot of our meat today is just processed under horrific conditions. It absolutely is. It absolutely, and I've seen some of those conditions, and it's it's devastating. It's horrible. Horrible. And I, think, I think what's ironic is that a lot of other religions they ask, you know, a blessing over the food, and it is very similar to um, an offering to whatever god that they subscribe to, and. I think that in in the killing of the animal, it is a way to kind of make a sacrifice and that sort of thing. And you're asking for the blessing, but the way that that animal was treated is so different. And I don't think that, as you said, it's fair for you to look at one where it's done respectfully and all of the animal was eaten versus those little chicken, those little baby chicken tumblers. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, and the thing is, you're not, you know, you're you're not just killing the animal and giving it to the deity and wasting all the meat and letting it rot. You're yeah, killing the animal. You're dedicating it to the god or goddess or whatever, but you're eating it. Yes. You're eating it. I wanted to ask you, um, as an Anglo-Saxon pagan, what is your concept or your belief on the concepts of absolute good and absolute evil. I kind of got an idea, but I want to know your opinion and, and, and what, you know, what do you have to say about that? Well, um, un until the last four years, I didn't believe in absolute evil. I'm not real sure now. 
No. <laughs> that took me a second, but okay. <laughs> yeah, sometimes well I done, sir. feel like that at times. But no, I don't believe in absolute good and absolute evil. I, I believe in mistakes and I believe that people can do horrible things and people can do wonderful things. I actually think the idea of absolute evil and absolute good is a very harmful thing. And I think we see that a lot in our society today. I agree. Um, we're at a point in our society where everything is brought into the light. Mm -hmm. I agree, that's good. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just going to bring up one thing because right now my husband and I are watching the uh, Harry Potter movies because we have them for a while and they're fun. <laughs> You know, I, I got before you answer. I've never seen a Harry Potter movie all the way through. Oh, you oh. got to watch them. They're amazing. <laughs> I admit it. I haven't. And he's one of these weird people in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always enjoyed them. I made a point of not because it was something I'd never read. And usually, anytime I saw a movie, I'd already read the books. So I made a point of not books until I saw the movies this time, which was an interesting experience for me. But my point is, I, like movies. I think a lot of people love, people love those movies. They were very dear to a lot of people. Now, well, recently, I'm sure you're aware, it's no big news thing or anything, uh, Rowling has made different comments. Uh, I've never seen any of them. I've just heard about this. About, you know, basically, she is kind of anti-trans Yes, I've heard that too. But like you, I haven't seen anything written out about that. I don't, I'm not questioning that this is true or anything like that. It's like she may very well be. But I'm not watching Rowling when I watch Harry Potter. Movies. That's right. That's right. You know, and if anybody really seriously thinks they're hurting her feelings, if they're going to boycott or something like that, this woman does not need your approval. She has gotten all your money already. She That's right. Multi-millionaire. <laughs> you know, so who are you hurting there? Yeah, you're not hurting her. Yeah. <laughs> I see this a lot. That's just one thing that just came to mind. Because like I said, we've been watching the movies, but I see this happening where we forget that there is no ultimate all, all good and all evil. And we will see people who we admired for some reason. I still admire Rowling. Uh -huh. Do I admire her in that regard? No. I think she needs to get over herself. Right, right. But she wrote a series, as a writer, she wrote a series of seven large novels that were coherent and kept a plot weaving through the entire thing. That was an amazing thing she did. Mm -hmm. And they were simple enough for children to understand and follow and yeah. not yes. to follow. And that people yes. From the age of six to sixty, and you know, love absolutely love. Yeah, I mean, she was amazing. She's not not amazing because of this other, right? You know, and and that's just one example. So often we will see people out there where they done something, you find out something they've done, and then all of a sudden, people want to boycott all their movies and boycott their books and boycott this. It's like. Why not keep the good part? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're condoning anything, but everybody, I mean, I'm sure, I don't even know what it is, but I'm just ready for the day when somebody sees me do something and suddenly there is no forgiveness. <laughs> and you know? that's cancel culture. It's, it's yeah. cancel culture is so relevant now. And I think that that definitely ties into the, this inherent idea of either absolute good or absolute evil. But humans have a propensity for both. And sometimes it's a mistake. Sometimes it's an uneducated comment. Sometimes it's a joke that went a little too far. Sometimes it is something truly evil, as you said, and as we've seen over the last four years. But that doesn't mean that good people don't have the capacity for evil and people with more evil don't have the capacity for good. We all have the capacity for both. And, you know, I, I think it's really a shame that she is doing what she's doing. I think it's a real error. I'm assuming this is all true, you know, but 
you know, why would you do that? I don't get it. Yeah, you because know, honestly, nobody really cares if she accepts trans people. Mm -hmm. What we don't want her to do is spouting off her, you, you know, like, lady, it's none of your damn business, so shut up, you know. So I have no idea why she's doing that. I think it's a big mistake. But I'm not going to not like Harry Potter because of what she's doing. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I can still admire the positive contributions that she made. Yeah. While despising something else that she's doing. You know, we all just are kind of a mix of these things. So, yeah, absolutely do not believe in absolute good and evil. That's the only one. Absolute. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I don't believe in absolute good. I don't believe in absolute evil. I think everybody and everything, uh, spirit, deity, human alike, is capable of a little bit of both. Yeah. And, you know, you just have to figure out on your own. Sometimes there are people who, I mean, you know, this doesn't mean you have to accept everybody. There are right. people who you have to go, okay, for me, the negatives are outweighing the positives this person has to not be part of my life anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not saying that. There are times when you have to make that judgment for yourself. Sometimes, you know, there are people who are really toxic in your life and you have to step away from them. But that still doesn't mean, and I've always felt this way. There have been people who I've been asked uh, opinions about people who I utterly despised and my response I always try to be, well, for me, you know, this person isn't working out for me. Yeah. I don't care for them. But I, as much as possible, I try not to just say, this is a bad person. Because sometimes someone who might be bad for me might not be bad for you. Yeah. And I think it's, it's definitely the way that your energies and the way that your belief systems line up and what sort of circumstances brought you together. Because, um, I mean... Ken is is from the South and born and raised here. And from from all other outside perspectives, you know, we shouldn't get along. We're very, very different. We shouldn't get along at all. But <laughs> we're a team and I love Ken. And so I think that it, it kind of depends on, you know, your circumstances, because you meet a lot of people that that shouldn't work with you, but just do. And vice versa, you meet some people that should be really, really good for you. And everybody says they're amazing and that they're so lovely and they don't want anything to do with you and you don't want anything to do with them. Yeah. Well, you know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. that. We're getting back to the whole pagan thing. You know, it's the, it's the, it's okay to be weird. It's okay. Mm -hmm. to be weird. You know, I understand exactly what you, you're talking about because there are people who, if you were just to describe someone to this person to me, I would think I do not want to be around this person, but it turns out we get along really, really well. There's other people who I ought to be you know, in partnerships with who I utterly despise. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're I say they're horrible people. It's just like I don't get on with them. I yeah. we don't click. We don't get along. With well, them. personally, I know some people that I consider horrible people. <laughs> let me okay let me ask you something i've got a list right? <laughs> you sacrifice if they're legal i do have a list <laughs> wait a couple right. years it was like I, some, I remember where this came up something came up about vampires went to in discussion with me i said oh yes i would love to be a vampire and they said well you know if you're a vampire you have to like kill people to, to survive and i said well I, I could get by for about seven years right now. <laughs> you could have my list. <laughs> you know, then if I ran out of my list, you know, if I ran out, I'd just get in my truck, hit the interstate, drive for a while, <laughs> fail to yield. <laughs> well, let, let, me, let me ask you this. Um, if you had to name somebody right now, who you would consider a modern day rune master, who would you consider that to be? That's a tough question. It is. It really is because there's so many different approaches to the runes. Right. I mean, you got Freya, you got Thorson, you got. Um, I'll give uh, you a hint. You don't got me. <laughs> you've got Gundarsson, you know. Okay. I, you know what? One person I want to name right now. 
uh, I, and this is one person who also, who I would love to meet in real life someday. Usually I've, everybody who I want to meet, I've either met them or they're dead. You got Paxson. There you go. Diana, Diana, Diana Paxson. Okay. I'd love to meet in person uh, for various reasons. But one thing I do like about her, now she generally writes about Elder Futhark, but when she writes, one thing I've always liked about what she does is she makes a very clear distinction in her writing between these are the historical meanings mm -hmm. and these are modern interpretations. And I think that's something that's very much lacking in a lot of room study now. Um, modern interpretations are great. They're wonderful. They're necessary. But it is, in my opinion, utterly idiotic to just sweep aside the wisdom of our ancestors. Absolutely. Actually started these runic systems. Absolutely. Um, I mean... And and I hate, I hate the so-called blank room. I hate that concept. There's no blank room. There's no damn thing at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I go out of my driveway, I'm finding a whole handful of blank rooms out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the, I mean, one man in 1980 or 82, something like that, came up with this idea and you still see that floating around. Yes, yes, you do. And it turns my stomach. I mean, it's like the space bar on your typewriter or word processor being the blank letter of the alphabet. <laughs> what would be the point of a blank rune? I don't know. I'm not familiar they with say, runes. They say, this guy says it's the rune of weird, which in my opinion is bullshit. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alaric, but the rune of weird is the Perthro rune. I would say Perth, yes, because you're talking, there's a, an element of chance in there. Uh, it the Perth is kind of looks sort of like a dice cup. Uh huh. And uh, if you look at well, it depends on which room poem, but the room poem, the English room poem, is talking about gaming and playing games. And and in England at that time, games were dice based games. That's what yes. Yes. You you will see uh, by ignorant people. I shouldn't say that, but it's just true. It's okay. You can say it because it's the truth. I write a book and they'll say, Perth means chess piece. <laughs> chess hadn't reached England then. It, they didn't know what chess was. So right. I, say, I will name this rune after a piece of a game that nobody's ever heard of before. No, I mean, it's like they, they dice. That's what their, their games were. And an interesting thing is it was more like Dungeon and Dragon dice. Their dice were... <laughs> Early, all six-sided dice. They had really funky you know, shaped dice that they would, they would play with. But yeah, so because of that, I would say pair, if you're going to talk about something just being being uh, referring to chance or fate, that's a good one for that. You but, can see the room that they're talking about in the second yeah. row, third from the right. That's the one that we're, we're talking about now. So you can see how it does look like that sort of dice cup. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's Perth or Perth row, depending. Um, Alaric, I got something else a little touchy I want to ask you about. And this is the wizard's table. We talk about whatever the hell we want to, buddy. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're going on the touchy here. Okay. Galina, up. <laughs> you ready? You ready? Okay. Galina Kraskova. I'm staying. Really? <laughs> I don't hate her or dislike her. <laughs> <laughs> She's not Anglo-Saxon, so yay, I don't have to deal with it. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend her books to anybody. I'll just say that. Okay. You know, I, I admit I bought a couple of her books out of curiosity. Fine with that. Okay. I bought a couple of her books out of curiosity, and she loves to talk about how she hangs from trees with uh, large uh, meat hooks and stuff to emulate Odin hanging from Yggdrasil. Yeah, there's... There are, yeah, well, <laughs> you're normal. Yeah. <laughs> you can say it, Alaric. You can say whatever you want on this show, buddy. Oh, well, you know, on the other hand, see, that's the thing. I, I mean, honestly, it's like at one point we were Facebook friends and we're not. And I think that should say enough because it takes a bit for me to say, okay, I'm over this. 
Right. Um, but at the same time, it's, in my opinion, I mean, she falls in that part of my life of not any of my damn business. You know, she's never done anything to me personally or anything like that. So I hope she finds whatever it is she's looking for. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I would not recommend her works to anybody, but I do know of somebody, I, I know somebody who actually wrote a forward to one of her books and bitterly regretted it later, but. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. But, you know, I, I also hate to talk about other authors. Yeah. Okay. And well, well, on that, on that, that public, that's really a terrifying thing. And they're, they're taking a huge chance. So it's that thing about nobody's totally good, and totally evil. We were talking about it's right, like right. credit for the fact that she puts it out there. Mm -hmm. and I know how hard that can be. Well, you're familiar with Raven Caldera. Yeah. And there's another one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not comfortable, we won't go there. We won't talk about it. And I'd rather not because again, okay. I say things about people that's not flattering. And and honestly, Raven actually is not so much. There are things that Raven has done that I really admire. So do I. So do I. As I'll say, admit it. It's not. I mean, I I would never recommend one of his books to somebody. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whose books would you recommend? Good question. There's this guy named Albertson who are really good. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm right. How do you spell his name? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, if you ever talk about Anglo Saxon runes, and I'm not saying this with a lot of hubris or anything, I think my book's the best. That's it. I wouldn't have gone to the trouble to do that if I didn't feel like there had been a real, not that one, the end of the yes. There it is. There it I is. I would not have gone to the trouble to write that if I hadn't felt like there was a real need. And saying it's the best, that doesn't, I'm not saying it's the best in the sense that it will always be the best. I'm saying it's the best in that I'm, you know, I'm in a really small pond. <laughs> you know, there's not a bunch of competition out there because everybody wants to write about the Elder Futhark. I have no idea why. Yes, they do. You're right. You know, yep. if, if there were more people who were focused on the Anglo-Saxon runes, I'm sure my book wouldn't be the best, but there's just very little out there. So right now, I would say that's your best. Well, I like your books, and I reference them all the time. For so. if you're interested, I'm going to plug for someone else. Can you go up on the top show so you can find? Um, it's called uh, it's by Grow Up. It's up there on the top shelf. I would be able to find. It. Oh, some staves, long staves, short staves, staves that growing on rocks, something about staves. That's right. Anyway, Groa Sheffield wrote this book. You can't find it, can you? Come here. Come here. Dragonius, come here. Come here. <laughs> My friend Dragonius is going to tell you how great I am for about two seconds while I go over here and find this book. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> you exist. I do exist, and uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely, you're more than welcome. You could have joined the whole time. We would have loved hey, to have yeah. you. You could have, I'm sure. Here. You would look for us. You can. It has nothing to do with stage. No, I just made up a whole. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the damn title is. <laughs> yes, you are into the Viking stuff. If you're into the Norse stuff, and you want to learn about runes where people actually are talking about something about real lore, here's my problem with the Elder Futhark. They are the oldest runes known, uh -huh. but nothing is known about them. It's like pretty much everything that has been written about them, it's all new agey type stuff. And that doesn't mean it doesn't work. Right. Okay? But nothing is known about them. There was no lore that survived from that period of time that far back. Mm -hmm. When we look at the rune poems, that just because it says this symbol means this in this culture doesn't mean it means the same thing in this culture. Right. Anything written about the Elder Futhark is pretty much made up. <laughs> Most of it. Most of your lore. And yeah. I would tell people, so I'll have people say, well, I've studied as the Elder Futhark, but I want to get into Anglo-Saxon runes. And I'm like, okay, you're in luck. Because most of what's written about the Elder Futhark was totally ripped off out of the old English rune poem. He's right. He's right. About Ak, Ash, Ear, Your, and Air, 
the other five runes that are missing from the Elder Futhark, and you suddenly know the Anglo-Saxon runes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you're, it's kind of like if you're working with the Elder Futhark, it's kind of like you're reading tarot, but you decided not to use the suit of pentacles for some reason. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Okay. I actually did the math, and it was like within one percent the same as if you left out the suit of pentacles from the tarot. Hmm. So, you know, but. It, that's what they used mostly, and mostly because the again the gentle versus harsh. Yes. If you're trying to sell a book on runes, it's a lot better to say this rune means warmth and friendship and tribe rather than to say this rune means a disease that kills children. <laughs> so they tended to go with <coughs> taken from the old English rune poem. Now, if you want to do I mean, so they're not really Norse. They're like old Proto-Germanic runes that nobody mm -hmm. knows anything about. If you really want to do the Viking thing, if you want to do the Norse runes, you want to do Younger Futhark. And the best book you're going to get for that, you've got it. How'd you do that? I'm you, really, really quick. <laughs> you are good. I tell you, you are good. Long brain. She is. She's awesome. Right. That's why she's my co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I know Groa. The woman is brilliant. Okay. Uh, she's Norse. She's Asa True. Uh huh. I rarely say this about people because I've got an IQ of 160. So, from my perspective, most people are, what's the word I'm looking for? Stupid. <laughs> says, just don't. <laughs> I'm very, I mean, I, I'm saying that facetiously, but I honestly, very rarely, really overwhelmed with somebody. This woman, when Norse lore starts pouring out of her mouth, I just shut up and sit there and listen. Yeah. She is amazing. Yeah. She knows it from top to bottom. And she wrote this wonderful book, Long Branches. It's a book specifically about the younger Futhark. And if you want to learn about Norse runes, real Norse runes, that's the one to go to. We'll show that one more time so everybody can make sure that they take a screenshot or write it down because yeah. definitely a good book to get your hands on. And if, if you get it, be sure to write the author and tell her that I recommended it and she owes me a cut. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, us too. Uh, so <laughs> let me ask you, let me ask you this, Alaric. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, have you ever, do you ever dabble in trolldom? No. Not at all? Ken, will you explain what that is? Because I don't know what that means. Uh, well, okay. So basically, trolldom is like the Northern European equivalent of uh, hoodoo folk magic. Oh. There's a lot of Christian elements involved and stuff like that. Um, I, I like trolldom myself. Um, I practice it a little bit. I'm not ad an adept, but I, I, I think it's cool. But then again, I'm all over the place. I practice <laughs> goetic magic. Alaric, I practice goetic magic. You know, I work with demons, I work with jinn, I work with angels, you know, whatever. Whatever gets the job done, I'm there. Chaos magic, you name it, I'm there. Yeah, and on the other hand, I'm very non-eclectic. I'm not a hardcore person, you know, like it has to have been done before such and such in this part. Yeah. I'm not like that or anything, but I'm not, I would never describe myself as eclectic. Um. When I am outside the box, I'm very aware of being outside the box. We, uh, you can't see it because I got the doors closed, but that's the television room. But we actually call it the Hellenic room because nice. all Hellenic deities in there. Nice. We don't mix them. Right. Now, this is my main room. This is our ancestor altar behind us. I got my main altar over here. And everything in here is going to be kind of Germanic, Anglo-Saxon. Uh, so we keep the Greeks in there. And, uh, you know, if, remember I said that if I was not going to be Anglo-Saxon, I would not be Norse. And quite right. often, if I was not Anglo-Saxon, and I can't imagine why I wouldn't be, but if I weren't, my next path would be Hellenic. I feel a bit of an attachment to Apollo. Okay. Uh, my husband feels a bit of an attachment to Athena. Okay. No other deities that we kind of like, but you know, I wouldn't say we have any attachment to them. We're just kind of interested in it. Uh, 
So I really like heck. Okay. Okay. I don't mix it with what I do. Mm. And I'm aware that I'm not doing an Anglo-Saxon thing when I'm over here, but I don't, I think it's stupid to make a hard line there. I mean, the way I see it, Anglo-Saxon, that's my family. Yeah. Okay, but it's okay to have friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. I think that's one of the beautiful things about magic and craft versus religion in the traditional sense is you can you can bring in all of these other things from all of these other different lineages or different deities and you can do whatever you can do whatever you want and i think that that's something that's so beautiful about magic is that you do get to be your own brand of weird yeah i mean i did a spell a while ago not too long ago uh there was a young man who I didn't, I don't know him, but I know his sister. And he was shot, it was like a weird ass thing. He was shot like in a drive-by thing. He wasn't even involved. I mean, somebody shot him. And it was kind of touch and go. It was a very serious injury he had. And she was very upset and worried. And I don't remember why I made this decision, but it just, it was the right thing to do. I actually did a working, a spell, uh, to help heal him and get him through this. And I did it more Greek style and did it with Apollo. I did it in there because that's Apollo's room, you know. <laughs> but it's like I'm okay with moving out there. It's like I needed my buddy Apollo to help with this. It was just important. Um, oh, because the guy's from Florida. That's why. <laughs> and I just, it just felt more that was who he was, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, yes. Yes. I felt like this guy was kind of his, so I I did that. Um, but no, I, I would not call. Him. Oh, can I can I move? Totally different subject. Yeah. Can I talk about that? Okay. I should talk about that. Yeah. Dragonius wants me to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. That. Okay. Please, please right. do. Okay, because this is something he has been helping me with. Uh, um, it's a project we've been working on for less than a year now, but I think we started talking about it in June, wasn't it? Pretty yeah. sure it was June. Maybe they should see us together when we're talking. <gasps> yeah, yeah, come on, come on in, come on in. <laughs> um, do you want me to scoot over? Oh, sure. Okay, make it a little bit easier. So. Otherwise, you're going to be leaning in. It's going to look like we're dating, and I know your wife's watching this, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, wife. <Mike. laughs> All right, this is my friend Agronis. He is a brilliant young man. He and his wife are my best friends here. I don't know what we would do if we didn't have him uh, living here in Dubuque with us. But anyway, he and I started talking about this in June, and we got some other people to do it. And we have started a group pretty much mostly online now. Is it online? You did. Um, it's called Solicia Magi Scriptor, which means... Uh, um, the Wizards Guilds, and we just call it SMS because nobody wants to say that big, long Latin thing. Uh, but anyway, SMS Wizardry, our goal is to, well, multiple goals. The real reason I came up with this idea is that there's no way to validate who you are to, you know, we're in this area and era now where you ask a question, go on Facebook and ask a question about anything, and you will have 500 experts telling you the answer. That's right. You know, and That's when you right. get the field of magic, well, what makes you an expert? There's nothing that... Now, I'm in the SCA. Do you know what that is? Mm -mm. Really? Okay. You should. You should check it out sometime. Uh, Society for Creative Anachronism. It, in a nutshell... It is, I had to do this so they know what a nutshell is, yes. In a nutshell, it is a international uh, educational organization that studies history by reenacting it. Oh. The combat, the arts, the sciences, and uh, pre-pandemic, it was absolutely awesome. Right now, it's kind of moving really slow, but we're hoping that, uh, you know, of course, that like the rest of the world, things will start opening up again. Um, Anyway, in the SCA, because of what they do, they have they give awards and honors and titles for people for their achievements. And because it's an educational thing, now if I wanted to know about um, early cooking styles, 
I could go, I, I, I can go to the FCA and immediately find people, laurels in cooking. They have awards for what they have proven and shown in cooking. Mm -hmm. Now you join the FCA. I don't really know you, Mistress B. You might be an expert at 12th century Anglo-Saxon recipes. I'm going to guess not, but it's possible. Okay? <laughs> but it, so if you've gone to the end of the SCA and you said, I'm an expert at 12th century Anglo-Saxon recipes, nobody's going to say you're a big liar. <laughs> Maybe you are. <laughs> but nobody's going to just accept that. They will expect you to show that you know this. And if you really are, you will wind up with a title of some kind and awards. I have uh, in our kingdom here, because the whole world is divided into kingdoms in the mm -hmm. SC. And in our kingdom, I have uh, what's called a leather mallet. It's an, a science award. I got my leather mallet for herbalism. So if someone knows that Alaric has a leather mallet in herbalism, they know Alaric knows a little bit about herbs. Mm -hmm. Contrast to me just coming up and saying, oh, yeah, I know all about herbs, you know. <laughs> so I thought, why don't we have that in our magical community? We kind of do to a limited degree. We More and more, like there are some online schools like Grace School of Wizardry and places like that that we're starting to get to where people can show what they know or learn what they know if they need to. But the idea of SMS Wizards Guild was, one, it gives you validation. If someone says, and we have an herbology guild, if someone says I'm an SMS journeyman herbologist, it means something. You know, it's they have evidence that they have shown that they know something. It doesn't mean if you don't have that that you're ignorant. You might come and know more about herbs than I do, but you have to show that you know about herbs before we acknowledge you as knowing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then also for people who want to learn. So you can be there just to show off, to validate what you're doing. But if people want to learn, we wanted a system for that where people could come in and, and just sign up and, and we give them a structure. And it's not necessarily the teacher-student structure that yeah, you're used to. No, it's that's why we called it guilds. Yeah. Nobody okay. is a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and it's driven by the members so if you come in and you want to study, I'm going to go with herbs again because I'm already on it. You know, it's like you decide what aspects of herbalism you want to study and explore. And you've got a master who is going to help guide you and who will, with the help of other people, like approve, like validate, say, oh, yes, they turned in this thing. So we know they know this. Oh, but you okay. decide what it's going to be. Yep. And it's your path? Yeah, it's your path. We don't force a path on people. Um, and it's been doing pretty good. Uh, SMS Wizardry, we have been going, I think we opened it in September because it took a while to get yeah. the, the initial structure going. Uh, this is our symbol is the seven pointed star because we started out with seven guilds. Seven guilds. That was our guild was to have, our goal was to have seven guilds to offer. Um, and that's currently all we have is seven, but hopefully we, we will be adding more to it. We've got, I know this, I can do this. He's going to do it. I'm going to do it. We've got artisans or artificers. Artifice. I keep saying that. And why, why do you screw up my girl? I know. It's <laughs> a, he's in charge of the artificer still. He's, he's a genius. And that artificers are people who are making magical things. Right. Wands, staves, ritual clothes. If you're kind of into that, Kind of arts and crafts for for wizards, you know. So it's it's uh it, it's, it's fun. It is it's a lot of fun. I'm I'm now a journeyman in, in and I was amazed that I became a journeyman in artisans. It, it was a lot of work on my part. Uh, we have uh, abjuration guild, which is protective magic. So it's like shielding, grounding, exorcism, that sort of thing. Um, there's another A. Oh, alchemy guild. Uh, the cart uh, the cartomancer guild. Uh, for reading cards, but it can be tarot, uh, playing cards, whatever floats your boat. They've got that Lernerman deck now. So any kind of card reading that fits into that guild. Um, healing guild, you might have the five now. Mm -hmm. Remember okay. your own? And then my two, yeah, the two that I had, two of them that I'm heading up is Obology and the Rune Guild. Mm -hmm. So you've got the seven guilds. 
And if anybody's interested in, in uh, pursuing this, it's really easy to get involved, uh, even if you don't know anybody. A lot of this is going on uh, on the internet right now uh, as we're growing. But if you go on onto Facebook, uh, you can just like, search in Facebook for SMS Wizards. It's that easy. Yeah. Okay. And, and when that group comes up, join the group. And there are like pinned posts where it's like, hey, you interested in herbs? Sign up here. Yeah. And you just leave a message. That, okay. Uh, uh, let's say, Ken, you wanted to do runes. You was like, just post, I'm interested in the rune guild. Well, you and I are already friends, so I could just send you a, a private message. But if you're not friends with anybody, any masters who would be doing that, someone will then send you a friend request. Okay. Okay. So if you're friends, the master of, or a master of the guild will then send you a private message saying, if you will send me your email, I'll get you hooked up in this guild. And then you start. We've got it set up where it's very safe. Uh, we have like a rule. If you're a novice, just because it would just be really hairy to have to deal with this more than this. But a no novice, you're only going to be doing that for a couple of days. It's just you get your stuff together and say, hey, I'm ready to start. So at novice, we don't do this. But as soon as you're an apprentice, anything you send to me as the master or whoever the master is, I have to send that and any reply I give you to a third party. And we do that so I mean, we know all of it's each other, right? Process. Yeah, and we know all of each other right now. So I, I don't see any problem right now, but we don't right. see the potential where down the road you have somebody who abuses this in some way. So to make sure, I mean, it's for the protection of people who are entering the guild, they don't have guilds, that they don't mm -hmm. have someone who is making inappropriate sexual advances or. Sure stupid demands that they shouldn't have to go through of any kind. Uh, so we've got like safeguards to make it a very safe place on the internet. And then you progress at your own rate. Uh, novice, if you are already experienced, you probably, you, you'll be asked at novice level to have certain things and you have a lot of freedom. Again, I'll go to herbalism. For herbalism, you have to have a basic herbal of some kind. You have to have a second book that specifically addresses magical herbalism, uh, and then you have to come. You have to obtain, and you can already have them, at least three herbs, and have some idea of what you would do with each of those three. Bam! You're ready. Now we send you a thing. You're an apprentice. An apprentice is a little more complicated, but basically that's the learning. You're at a learning stage, and if you don't need to learn, you're going to ace right through it. Yeah. If you want to learn, though, it's a, you get an outline. We call them a scroll because somebody <sighs> made them up where they look like scrolls that we send to you. So you get your scroll and you complete. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Anyway, you, uh, you, you can finish out your scroll on Apprentice and then you're a, a journeyman. And at journeyman, you can mm -hmm. do that for as long as you want. We hope that some journeyman will move on to master because the real difference between master and journeyman is the master will then take on apprentices, you know, more apprentices. Right, right. Uh, you know, but anyway, so if you're interested in it, you go to SMS Wizards and just plug in and bring, yeah, there you go. They are good, aren't they? They are good. And uh, sign up for whatever you want to sign up for. And again, it's not a school. We want to make that really clear. It is a set of guilds. So it's people helping people. And it's... It will be driven by you. You will be learning your magic. You won't be having somebody telling you how you have to do it. Mm -hmm. so, and so far, I'm really pleased with it. I've been really amazed. Well, haven't yeah. you? I mean, I've just been amazed at some of the things. You were, and I was thinking about that when you are talking about runes. And I was like, I've had people today, I've been interacting this morning with two different people in the, in the room guild who just, they are just astounding. It's, as long I've been dealing with runes since 1980. I started messing around with runes, and it's like I was. I got these things from from two of my journeymen today. Two different ones where they had insights in these runes, things I had never considered, never even thought of. Uh, so we are. We have some really fantastic people getting involved in SMS Wizardry. That is a lot. That is that is a lot, and that's awesome. 
That is awesome. What, what a lot of work and dedication, man. You guys are like for real. We are pretty cool. Yeah, we're brothers in arms. You, you guys are like cool, right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> or weird to some people. <laughs> or weird. We're kind of weird. Too. Uh, I bet you. I bet you. I got you beat on the weird. <laughs> oh, yeah. speaking of weird, W Y R D. For uh -huh. those that don't know about the concept of weird, would you mind explaining that to them? There are people who don't know. Oh, I don't there's, know. <laughs> there's a lot of people that don't know. Weird is a very basic concept to the Anglo-Saxons, fundamental concept. And at the same time, it's a very difficult concept to put across to modern people. Yes. Um, I like to think of it as the unfolding of the universe. Weird is the result of all of your actions and everything that has ever been in your past. Uh, Groa, the aforementioned Groa Sheffield, who wrote this book, one thing she said to me I thought was really profound one time. She was talking about uh, in Asatru, they have what they call the nine noble virtues. That's right. Like uh, the heathen equivalent of Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And this comment, I thought it was really good. She said, if you understand weird, you don't need any of that. And, oh, you're so right. You just hit me. Weird is the essence of ethics for yes. European people. Uh, the the so-called threefold law could be thought of as explaining weird to toddlers. You know, it's very, very simplified, but it kind of gets that point across that what you're doing, it's taking you forward. That's your weird. That's where you're going. Uh, you, you, we're all dealt a hand at birth. You know, all men are not created equal. It'd be all men should have equal opportunity, but we all know we're not all created equal. Some of us are created with silver spoons in our mouths, and some of us have a really hard uphill climb for That's one. That's right. Another. That's right. You know, but you start out with your dealt something. You start with something, and this is something that comes down to you from, you know, your ancestors and your history and everything like that. So you start out right here, and then immediately you're going to be adding things to that. You're going to be adding your own actions and your own words to that. And that shapes your weird. You know, I mean, you may start with really crappy weird, you know, and you will. I mean, you know, so we have to face this. Like, like we want, some people want to be really fluffy about it. And everybody's path is different. Right? Yeah. People want and make it like, oh, it's all wonderful, blah, blah. It's not always wonderful. You know, the person who's born to, you know, a, a very poor family, possibly, you know, a single parent family where the parent is has to work all day and they, you know, they have to eat ramen noodles every night. They don't have, they're not starting out with this great thing. They start with crappy weird. That's all there is to it. But your actions, it's like, you can't help this. All you can help is this, your actions going forward. So that's what weird is. Sometimes it's interpreted as destiny or fate, but mm -hmm. fate implies you're powerless. But yeah. weird is not as fixed as as the 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 Greek concept of fates. Am I oh, correct? It's like you're not powerless with weird. It's like weird is something that you are shaping, that you are making. We just had we we had an incident happen where a in our local pagan group. It's not a coven or anything it's kind of a semi-public pagan group where we had a person who was very problematic and this person was needed to not be part of our group okay. and there were people in the group who wanted to throw the person out and i said no and the reason was the way I explained it. When I explained it this way, everybody got it. And the ones who wanted to throw her out, they were okay. It's like, no, we will set boundaries on what can this person can do, but we will never throw someone out. If that person chooses not to be part of our group, that's fine. But we're not bringing that into our weird. Mm hmm they came to us for a reason. Yes, it's like when when everything you do becomes a part of you, you know, becomes a 
part of your weird. It shapes who you are and your relationship with the universe. So that's weird. And again, it's like it's not something you can really explain in 25 words. Right. No, no. I, I Because, you know, I wanted your 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 perspective on it, your explanation. I've tried to explain it to people. And uh, I've spent an hour and they still don't really get it. Um, now, uh, you know, I, I mostly worked with the uh, Scandinavian, the Norse gods, Odin, Thor, Freya, you know, the, those guys. Um but not so much the Anglo-Saxon until I got your wonderful books. Do you as an Anglo-Saxon pagan slash heathen, whatever, have Norns in O R N S Norns. How do the Norn, where do the Norns come into play with, with, well, with, what you do? Thinking, like, I don't want to say totally no, because you don't really see Norns described as such, but you remember Shakespeare? Yes. Macbeth? This one play, and it featured the three weird <laughs> sisters. Yeah. Okay. That's who they are. I so got you. you. Got the concept. I don't think for the Anglo-Saxons it was pictured necessarily the same way. But there is the idea of weird being personified as three sisters. Okay. Okay. Well, now let me ask you this. Have you ever had to deal or had to help anyone else deal with a negative entity, a negative oh. spirit? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, and I address that in Travels to Middle Earth, I think. It's like, that's... I did a lot of spiritist type stuff when I was young. I mean, just because that's what I was exposed to and all. And uh, I was actually, at one point, I was a pretty good medium. I belonged to this group in Springfield called the Seekers. And it was an interesting group. It was different religions. There were Christians in it and pagans and, you know, like a bunch of different people. We would get together on Saturday nights at this place out in the country. This elderly couple had a beautiful, sprawling ranch house, and we'd meet there, have coffee. There was a whole kind of program. Uh, we'd get together, and uh, after the little social period, then there would be like this reading where we would, some, like somebody would be reading aloud from some text that we were working on. I remember we did some Rosicrucian stuff, the Seth books were really in for a while. You know, and so they would have this kind of like a lesson thing. And then there'd be a little break where we'd have coffee. And then we get that together for the big point, the highlight of the thing was what they called fellowship. And fellowship was a big damn seance. Yeah. That's what it was. It was a yeah. Seance. They had this big thing on the round table, and everybody get around this table and we'd have our seance. And there were, a, there were like a few of us. I don't remember exactly how many. I'm guessing like four or five. But I'm sure it fluctuated a little bit too over time. Uh, who had the ability. And so you had these mediums. And it was pretty cool. I mean, it was kind of amazing. For me, when I would go into a trance, I had no memory of it. Mm -hmm. I, it to me, subjectively, it was like I just kind of fell asleep for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, people have to tell me anything that somebody said through me. But there were things I found really interesting. First of all, there was always a group of us there, like three or four of us there who could do it. And it wasn't like we drew straws or anything. Nobody knew who was going to, but just spontaneously one of us would go into a trance. Um, and some of the things that... Uh, came out was very impressive. Um, the reason I quit, though, I quit doing it, uh, was one night a woman named Linda, who is one of the uh, mediums, she went into a trance. We're all holding hands. Linda goes under, and all of a sudden she sits up, and she announces, I am a mystic master. And everybody at that table, except the mediums, mm -hmm. interestingly mm -hmm. enough, everybody else was like, 
Ooh, a mystic master. <laughs> All I could think of was if I had just walked in through the door and said, hey, I'm a mystic master, I would have laughed at. But because this dead person says it, mm -hmm. no judgment or anything, everybody loved this mystic master coming out and it really made me realize nobody's you know there, there's nobody running this ship you know and if you know and here i'm in this position where i'm being very vulnerable literally letting go of my psyche and letting anything come in mm -hmm. and yeah. it, Freaked me out so much. I have never done it since then. I just stopped doing it. Really? Yeah. And you know, I mentioned in Travis the Middle Earth, if you think that every little spirit out there is Tinkerbell, that's you know, right. Yeah. You're got. I mean, a man. That's right. That's right. Okay. And so many of these uh, fluff bunny New Agers, they think that. Yeah. You go back to Tolkien. You know, you talk about uh, a lot of these non-human races were actually spirit beings. That's right. Early Europeans, elves. Elf is just a English word meaning a spirit. Yeah, and they weren't nice. We had the elves. We heard the orcs. Mm -hmm. Orcs were real things. They were yes. hostile spirits. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, seriously, do you think a guy like I'm like I'm in Yankee territory up here in Dubuque? You know, do you think if some dead Confederate soldier comes in, he's going to be really happy with the people around here? No, he will. <laughs> you know, um, you know, let's let's find a, a dead Nazi. He's probably not going to be your bud. That's you know, right. Just because somebody died, they said they're not going to suddenly. Right. They're they're not all of a sudden enlightened. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's something where people should freak out or be afraid or anything like that. But you know, you have to use some judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's there are going to be negatives, and I have run across, even though I haven't done medium work since then, I have run across situations where people had to deal with hostile negative. Spirits. Well, yeah. we got a we got a question from a good friend who runs a, a podcast called Ancestral Eyes, Teresa Silowinski. Can you put it up about the heathenry? Uh, basically, Teresa, and I would like for you to answer this, Alaric. Teresa Sil Silowinski says, I thought heathenry had to do with Germanic groups. Yes. I don't know. What do you want? That Yes, you are right. I'm not sure what the question is. I thought heathenry had to do with Germanic groups. She wants That's to make, she wants to, go ahead, B. Go ahead. I think she just wanted to confirm. Right. Okay. Well, then, yes, let me confirm that. Yes. She Heathen just wanted, yeah, confirmation. I, I get into linguistics. Heathen and pagan are synonyms. They mean the right. same thing. A yeah. pagan was one of the Pagani. It was one of the country dwellers. Mm -hmm. right? A heathen dweller on the heath. On the heath, a country dweller. Both mm -hmm. of them are ways of saying that hick over there. They were disturbed. They, yeah. they it's like they were disparaging terms for people who were holding on to old traditions in modern lingo. It's like when people are saying, I'm heathen. They are people who are <clears throat> pagans who are almost always pagans who follow a Northern European tradition, a Germanic mm -hmm. tradition. Uh, Celts usually don't use heathens, but I've met some Celts who do like that work. You know, so it's, you know, mostly it, it is Germanic groups. All of them, and you say Germanic, you're talking about Northern Europe. You're talking about not just... Uh, Germany, but England and all the Scandinavian countries, etc. Cool. All right. Well, do we have any other questions from the audience? We have about five minutes left. I think we're good. I, I guess. I uh, guess we are. What about or? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. One more plug for somebody else because I like to plug other people. Absolutely. Pandemic, like I'm sure, like you understand, like we're all going nuts. We aren't doing anything. Nobody gets to go anywhere. So I would like to announce. I actually have an event that I will be going to, not tomorrow. Um, I'm I'm on my way to get my second vaccination in a couple of weeks. 
And but the next event, like gathering that I will be going to, will be the Earth Warriors Festival, which takes place in um, Ohio, not far from Cincinnati. If you live anywhere in Ohio or the surrounding region, fairly close to it, you should definitely check out Earth Warriors Festival. It is being held this year from September 30th to October 3rd. Um, and Earth Warriors, I have been there before. I actually asked if I could, this is the first time I've done this, I asked if I could be a speaker because I really miss people, I miss things. And as many different events that I've been to, Earth Warriors is my all time favorite. It's a smaller festival, but it has great people, a great tribal feeling. So if you live close enough, think about going to it. And of course, you can find it on Facebook if you just like search for Earth Warriors Festival. Okay. Awesome. Very, so. very, very cool. So Alaric, thank you so much, man. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I really, really appreciate it. We both do. Um, other than what you just, do you have any final words for anyone who's interested in getting involved in paganism? Not just Anglo-Saxon paganism, but paganism of any culture. What would you tell them to do besides well, read your books? <laughs> oh, what would I tell them? I would say, talk to the gods, talk to your gods, find out what they have to say, find your path, uh, be prepared for no matter what you do, you're doing it wrong. I can tell you that right now. So don't worry about that. You're <laughs> okay. told how you're doing it wrong. But the fact is you're not. So, you know, talk to your gods, talk to your ancestors. Absolutely. Um, and find your own path. Look for local groups. Yeah. If we had not done for, that, I would have never met this man. Yeah. Look for local Absolutely. And again, here's the group that they talked about earlier. This might be a really good place for you to start and get in touch with people who are going to be able to guide you with not only the best intentions, but a lot of knowledge and community. So that might be a really good group for you to start out with. Awesome. Fantastic. Great show. Thank you again. Uh, thank you for everyone who tuned in to The Wizard's Table. <laughs> Next Saturday, right, Mr. Spee? Yes, we have another episode. Next Saturday, we have Carolina Dean, hoodoo practitioner, very powerful hoodoo practitioner. So you definitely want to tune in for that. 6 p.m. Eastern Time, The Wizard's Table, RU Media, Alaric, thank you so much. Mr. B, thank you. Uh, and thank me. Yeah, thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Have a great night, everybody.